Hello and welcome to the first Dark Money Files Live Online. I am George Barrow and will be your producer and organiser for this event. This is the first ever online version of our TDMF Live series, so please excuse any technical glitches or minor problems that may arise. We will begin with a presentation that Graham and Ray have created on the topic of the basic red flags of shell companies, and then we'll have a moderated Q&A afterwards. So please feel free to submit any questions you may have throughout the presentation on the Q&A tab to the right of your screen. Now, we are running these events for free and you're welcome to keep coming as long as you like on that basis. But like everyone, the coronavirus has somewhat disrupted our normal income. So if you've enjoyed this event and would like to help us cover our costs, it would be greatly appreciated and it will make further events over the long term much more likely. We've added, a, we've added a donate button to the registration page on our website, as well as the information on this Teams meeting that you can click and contribute if you would like to and are able to, but please do not feel under any compunction to do so. And our sincere thanks to the people who have done so already without waiting to find out if we'd be worth it. Now, I shall leave you in the capable hands of both Graham and Ray to kick us off, and I hope you all have a great time. Uh, thanks, George. Uh, hello and welcome to another presentation of the very first The Dark Money Files Live Online event in which we shine a light remotely uh, into a murky world. I'm Ray Blake. With me is my co-host, friend and business partner, Graham Barrow. Hello, Graham. Hello, Ray. Mm, well, this is exciting, isn't it? Uh, it's really rather amazing, Ray. How often it seems these days we have to revise everything we take for granted. The the coronavirus situation is is clearly a, a nightmare. But through it, we found a way to get these live events, which until now have been frankly quite exclusive affairs, mm. out to a much wider group. Uh, that's true, Graham. And while I imagine that people online today may well have heard our podcast. Well, you mean the Dark Money Files, which mm. is available via Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all good podcast platforms. Uh, and most of the bad ones, too. True. Um, yep, that's the one, Graham. Uh, many listeners won't have been to one of our live events before. Uh, I think you're absolutely right, Ray. So, so, Ray, what are we going to talk about in this very special section and what can people expect? Well, the topic is one we presented at our very first live event in London at the end of last year, which seems a long time ago now. Mm. Um, no one turned up to that one in their pyjamas, so that's going to be a bit different to today. Um, it's one intriguing story which we'd fought shy of including in a podcast because it's so complex it would have been hard to do it justice. But here in this forum where we can use a few visuals to help, it just seems the perfect time to talk about it. Yes, it does. And Ray, it is quite a story, isn't it? Well, a story that links Roman Abramovich, a Russian coal mine, a Cypriot diamond store, a president of a Russian state, an alleged murderer, a Colombian gang and the Russian mafia is going to be worth telling, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, when you put it like that. Mm. Um, and as you say, we can use visuals that we will mm -hmm. be referring to, um, as well as our notes as we work through the story, because as you're going to see, everybody, this is quite a tale and it's full of twists and turns. And we want to make sure we get it right, because our solicitors have told us to. <laughs> solicitors <laughs> uh, well, in, in my head we have them <laughs> yeah absolutely and nowhere else um no. george is going to be lurking online logging any questions you have and he'll read out some of them at the end which we'll then go on to discuss and last time we had quite a lively debate and that's great uh so please if there's anything that occurs to you as we go through the story use the team's chat facility to, to uh, or q a facility i should say to post your question Yes, please do. And as Ray says, we, we had really good fun last time, didn't we, Ray? Discussing <laughs> as many of them as we could at the end of the presentation. Uh, right then. So that's the admin done. Uh, where should we begin with the story, Graham? Um, UK Companies House, Ray. Now, given the list that I read out uh, of, of actors in our story, that seems a strange place to start. Well, I guess. But would you believe that the one element that binds this story together is, is a UK limited company? Well, actually, mm. two UK limited companies, but we'll get to the second one, which is called Laidon Group Limited, a bit later. And so our story begins with Lirum Capital Investments Limited. And, and Ray, talking about 
our imaginary solicitor, so I guess we'd better add our usual rider here. Oh, definitely. Yeah, there is no suggestion. And we want to make this very clear. There's no suggestion that any of the people involved in this story are criminals or engaged in criminal acts. Well, except for the murderer. Right? Uh, that's a fair point, Graham. Yes, except for the murderer. Uh, there's no suggestion that any of the people involved in this story are criminals or engaged in criminal acts. We seek merely to report what we see and what we've read impartially and without any judgment. Exactly. So, what do we know? Well, as you can see from the slide, this is an active company, company sorry, and it was incorporated oh, about eight and a half years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it just cannot make up its mind if it's a business or if it's dormant. Um, mm. uh, well, we'll see. Is it active? Is it dormant? Mm. That's a very good question, Graham. And as we work through the story, our audience can perhaps make up their own minds um, on that point. Mm. So let's look at the um, people involved, Graham, shall we? Okie doke. <clears throat> you will notice that there are 15 officers listed, um, most of whom have later resigned. Uh, initially, the firm could not make up its mind who should be director and who should be secretary, as we're going to see. But either way, it was initially run by a Latvian lady called uh, Yulia Lopatina, who lived in England and a Kazakh called Igor Rudik, who lived in Kazakhstan, but he also had a London correspondence address. Ah, now, can I throw in an odd little snippet here, Graham? Ray, your snippets are always worth throwing in. Oh, you say that to all the boys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, but, but do, do. Yeah, um, OK, I, well, I will. Um, Mr Rudik has a really odd correspondence address. Uh, look, I'm going to be honest, Ray, that just looks like an address. Uh, it does, yes, until you try and go and look at it in Google Street View and then something weird happens, which you may not be able to see at that size. So let's zoom in a little. Um, notice the blue lines on all the big roads around there, uh, which conveniently blank uh, with a stretch of road that's got 40 seals at terrace right in the middle. Um, and what that indicates is that uh, Google Street View doesn't go there. Um, they, they've received a, a, a notice that, that requires them not uh, to produce images of that part of the road for some reason. Well, that's weird. Isn't it? And it's been that way ever since Google Street View began in uh, 2008. So if you want to see all sit terrace, you've got to actually go there and look for yourself. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that is weird. Um, thank you for that snippet. It's an intriguing one. Uh, no worries. Sh shall we move on? Uh, let. So Liram, uh, established in 2011. Um, let's see what was happening. 2011 uh, was actually quite a big year in London. I don't know if what? you remember. Oh, I think it was probably 2012, but but I'm, oh, I'm going to yeah, run you know, with this. Right. Yeah, 2012, actually, you said it was a big year. I think it was the same length as most other years. But, but I get your point. It was a momentous year in London because we hosted the Olympic Games. Uh, we're all about the pedantry, Graham, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. um, but, it, but it was uh, a, a quieter year uh, for Liram. Um, they appointed a new director, this time a Russian living in Russia called Igor Gurov. Um, and they changed Mr. Rudik's address. Do you remember him? I uh, do. To the UK registered office. Uh, OK, that's mildly interesting, but I can't mm -hmm. say it's particularly remarkable. Well, then in 2013, things start to warm up. And there's a visual reference here to the launch of the Xbox One, which I believe is very popular with the young people these days. So rumour has it, Ray. Mm. Um, uh, so 2013, and they received yep. it in 2011, so Liram would have needed to post it some accounts by now. Oh, yes, uh, and they did. Um, dormant company accounts. OK, so they fell on the side of the dormancy and not the mining and quarrying. OK, fine. Yeah, then, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we'll see how long that continues. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's where they started off. Um, Mr. Rudik resigned. Oh, bye bye. Yeah. And so did uh, Mr. Gurov after oh. a relatively short period. OK. Um, but you'll remember um, Yulia uh, Lopatina. Uh, she became a director again, as well as being secretary. Oh. Um, 
and uh, good news, Mr. Rudick came back. <laughs> of course he did. So Miss Lapata, I believe that's called, is now double hatting. Um, uh, indeed. Uh, and, and yeah, Mr. Rudick's reappeared. Yeah, not for long though, because two weeks later, uh, she resigns. So she didn't like wearing two hats, obviously. Indeed. Hmm. Okay, so uh, 2013, as you said, 2013 warmed up a bit. 2014, well, I think we know yeah. who that is. Kate right. Bush sang live, Graham. Uh, Hammersmith, Ray. Mm. Okay, um, so that was Hammersmith and Kate Bush. What was happening at Lerum? Well, uh, another new director, um, another Russian, this time uh, called Evgeny Ivanikov. Um, but Mr. Rudik sadly resigned again. <laughs> Bye again. Um, more dormant accounts, Ray. Okay. More dormant accounts, absolutely. And then came uh, 2015. 2015. Oh, yeah, 2015. That's that's not that's sad. Um, yeah, Charlie Hebdo. So uh, yep. what what was happening at Lerum? Uh, well, another year, um, another opportunity for Igor Rudik to serve another stint as director. Um, <laughs> this is looking like sliding doors or revolving doors, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, uh, and um, Mr. Ivanikov obviously had enough because uh, he left the same year. And that, you know, I'm going to have a stab in the dark. And yes, more you don't need to, Graham. Okay. Yeah, accounts, they're still uh, dormant. Um, well, OK, uh, this is starting to get quite interesting. So 2016, that's a big year, wasn't it, Ray? Uh, well, quite an exciting year, Graham, in, uh, uh, in one way or another. Yeah, mm, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah let's, not, let's not dwell on that. No, let's not. Um, um, Liram appointed a new director. Uh, go on, another Russian, was it? Uh, hmm. uh, no, uh, a Colombian, in fact. A Colombian, of course it was. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't actually see that one coming. <laughs> None of us saw that coming, Graham. Um, <laughs> meet Mr. Juan Saavedra, uh, newly appointed as a director. Well, hello, Juan. And, and did it make any difference to the accounts that year, Ray? Uh, no, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> and how's Miss Lepatina? Oh, uh, yeah, um, resigns again. This time she's resigned as secretary as well as a, a, a director. Oh. And another Colombian, uh, Eduardo Saavedra, uh, was made a director. Well, that could be the most extraordinary coincidence, or, or, or maybe they are in some way related. <laughs> they could, by some bizarre chance, be related, I suspect. Um, okay. And then, of course, uh, it's time for Igor Rudik <laughs> to resign <laughs> again. Of course. Um, <laughs> extraordinary. Um, mm -hmm. 2016, of course, is, is, is in my world of, um, of geeky company's house stuff, a big year because it was the year they introduced the requirement to name what mm -hmm. they call a person with significant control, but we, we would probably call owner. So did yeah. they? Yeah, yeah, they did appoint a person with significant control uh, in accordance with the law, and it was a company called Hasborn Overseas Limited. Okay, that that's a bit strange because that looks to me like they've misspelled overseas. Ah, now hold that thought, Graham. Okay. Um, Eduardo Saavedra resigns as a director uh, <laughs> and is uh, replaced by another Colombian, okay. um, Segundo Vargas. Okay. Uh, yeah, and they also added Hasborn Overseas as a director as well as their PSC. And filed more dormant accounts. You know, <coughs> I, I've got to a point where I need to say that this is a really busy life for mm. a, a dormant company. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Um, yeah. And then in 2017, uh, as vast crowds were gathering, you may remember, in Washington, D.C. Oh, massive crowds, right? Crowds the size of which you couldn't even imagine, Graham, although someone seemed able to. Uh, anyway, um, in that year, uh, oddly, Juan Saavedra changed his name. Oh, go on, mm. to, I'm excited <laughs> now. Pablo uh, Saavedra, uh, John Begat Paul, if you like. Uh, so in my world, that'd be almost Beatlesque. <laughs> 
I was thinking biblical, but that yeah, that works too. Okay, no, 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 that's it, it's it's still um um amazing, uh, and I yeah. think I'm right in saying that that Hasborn changed its name as well. It did, it did. Uh, to to Hasbrone Overseas uh, Limited, and I think what they've done there is corrected one misspelling and introduced a different one. I just I've got to say it again, Ray. There's a lot mm. of name changes going on, isn't there? Uh, yeah, and there are more as well as these ones we're featuring. Um, mm. But but one thing uh, in all of this does remain the same. The song? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're still filing dormant accounts every uh, year. Of course they are. So um, I, hope springs eternal. So 2018, that's not a great thing. That was Jamal Khashoggi dying in an Istanbul embassy. So... Um, uh, yeah, I'm not even going to say allegedly, Graham. No. Um, so, uh, what else happened at Hasbro in that year, Ray? Let's have a look. Well, uh, the usual dormant accounts. Of course. Um, did what happened with Hasbro? Oh, they 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 they've changed their name and now they're not going to be PSA anymore. They've they've stormed out in a huff. <laughs> no. Uh, Okay, so so Juan Pablo, whatever his name is, and and Segundo Vargas are appointed as PSCs. Wow! Yeah, the company is now owned by Juan and Segundo, <laughs> the old one two, as it were. Yeah, uh, yeah, multilingual <laughs> joke there. Multi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so so moving moving on to uh, the following year, yeah. uh, twenty nineteen, five stalls there, um, with their chairs behind them. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, do you know that's a very eclectic bunch of fellows? I, I wonder what happened to them. Oh, I think we can say mixed fortunes, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> uh, meanwhile, uh, at Liram uh, in 2019, uh, Segundo uh, resigned as secretary to be replaced by Pablo, and Pablo resigned as director to be replaced by Segundo. Ray, I know this is a stupid question, but why? Why? Uh, I I have no idea, Graham. But I can tell you uh, that in August 2019, they filed their latest set of dormant accounts. And and Ray, we, this is not even half the story yet, is it? It isn't. This is only the half of the story that's told by the official records at Company's House. Uh, you know, in, out in the outside world, Liram's getting up to all sorts. Well, it is, Ray. So is this the good point to start talking about Roman Abramovich? Uh, yeah, let's do that, shall we? OK, so according to an account in the UK paper called The Guardian back in December 2015, mm -hmm. Liram this dormant company, <laughs> bought a coal mine in Siberia from a company Ooh. called Evraz, which, of course, is controlled by the said Mr. Abramovich. Now, I need hardly add, uh, we can't see that from the accounts that they filed, but apparently mm. that company was bought for $160, as I understand <laughs> it. Well, that is what the reports say, although uh, at the time it was allegedly making huge losses following an explosion there the year before. Uh, nevertheless, Liram assert that despite their dormant company status, they rapidly turned it into a profit making concern before Igor Rudik arrived in Russia. Now, I'm sure we all remember Mr. Rudik and his mysterious home in Orsett Terrace. Um, and according to The Guardian, he's British educated and made his money in Kyrgyzstan, even though he's listed as a Kazakh living now in Kazakhstan on company's house. Yeah, and, and the, according to the report, he was arrested shortly after arriving in Russia mm. and told that he faced five years in a Siberian prison if he didn't sign the company over <clears> to another <throat> company that was linked to another oligarch called Alexander Shukin. Now, this is a claim completely denied by Shukin's company, of course. As we are obliged to say, yes. Um, yeah. Um, and that led to a mm -hmm. court case filed in Cook County, Illinois, <laughs> by, <laughs> by Liram against Baker McKenzie. Uh, international well-known firm of solicitors, Baker uh, McKenzie. He, yes, them, exactly. And, and mm. according to the press reports, it was filed by Liram and its owner, Daniel Rodriguez. 
Uh, who? <laughs> I don't remember his name uh, in our cast of characters. Uh, that's because he's not actually in our cast of characters, Ray. Unless, of course, he uh. was the owner of Hasbro or Hasbro or whatever that was called. All oh, right, okay. Uh, and why Cook County, Illinois? Well, apparently, it's the nearest court to where Baker McKenzie are now headquartered. <laughs> okay, right. So that's the coal. Uh, what about the diamonds? Well, we now need to shift our focus to Cyprus. Oh, Cyprus. Fancy. Yes. Well, back in 2015, rather excitingly, the world famous Graf Diamond Company opened a branch in Limassol. Oh, sounds fabulous. Well, it looks pretty glamorous, doesn't it, from that mm. photo? Um, sadly, though, it didn't work out right. Oh, dear. Well, w w was, there, was there no demand? uh for diamonds in cyprus uh <laughs> yeah as if um no it, it wasn't that it, it actually appears to be more to do with the falling out of various russian gentlemen who between them were running the business okay so one of whom uh rizlan aka rustem uh mm. magdaev mm. is reported to be one of the present owners of lirum although you wouldn't know that from company's house yeah, no, you wouldn't. Um, but Mr. Magdaev is also reported to be a close friend of either the Prime Minister or President, or possibly both, of Tatarstan. And allegedly also has ties to a shady figure called Radish Yusupov, uh, leader of the Sevastopolsky crime group, and a larger-than-life character who's allegedly confessed to at least eight murders and who sometimes accompanied uh, Magdiev to business re uh, to business meetings for, for some reason or other. Yeah, I was going to say, wouldn't you love to be there? But actually thinking about it, no, I probably no, wouldn't. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I um, don't think so. No, and, and unbelievably, this is a point that gets really weird. <laughs> it does. Uh, you remember we, we, back at the start, referenced a UK company called Laidon Group. I do. Well, coincidentally, and the way that we arrive at this is through looking at the uh, the actual goings on of Lirum. Um, there's a Ladon group based in Colombia, which extracts emeralds, and is run by an interesting couple of uh, couple of gentlemen called. Wait for it, <clears throat> Montes Vargas Hector Secundo and Juan Pablo Saavedra Martinez. <laughs> Um, mm. Mm. Uh, and Juan Pablo uh, has a brother called Eduardo. Uh, well, um, you see, Laidon Group in London, Ray, has a, a PSC, uh, and it's, his name is Hector Montes. Uh, so it is, which, um, I mean, that might be coincidental. I it, don't know. It, it could be, but you see, Lirum uh, has a PSC, and, and they're called... Pablo Saavedra. Oh, look, there's another coincidence there. Uh, and they've got a second PSC, haven't they? They do. Um, and their second PSC is called, uh, oh, Segundo Vargas. Segundo Vargas. I mean, that. That's, that's, that's odd, isn't it? <laughs> Well, I think that's odd. And and let's not forget, the press is still asserting that Lirum is owned by Daniel Martinez. Yeah, who could be, let's face mm -hmm. it, based on that evidence, Juan Pablo, or, or it, it could be Eduardo, or of course it could be someone else entirely. Absolutely. So let's sum up, shall we? Okay, so yes, in summary, we have a dormant British company that is owned now by Colombians. Associated with Russian coal mines and Cypriot diamond stores. We have a man who, who works for some important person in Tatarstan, probably the president. Yeah, who rubs shoulders with the murderous head of a Russian crime gang. Um, we've got several Russian oligarchs and at least two court cases. Oh, and Lirum is also, according to the press, now being investigated by Companies House. And, and we also should add, for all it is a dormant company, that, it, it, that Lirum has employed a very prestigious firm of London solicitors. And therefore, we absolutely mm. need to make clear that we are merely reporting what others have said. And we do not assert in any way to the accuracy of any of this. Can I, can I just note that that's extremely well said and I echo every word of that disclaimer, Graham. 
Well, thank you, Ray. So there we have it. Although, given the prestigious firm of London solicitors, you do wonder how Liram are paying the bills. As a dormant company, yeah, indeed. Yeah. I mean, it's a fantastic story, Graham, but it's it's in all senses of the word. Uh, but it's but it's more than that, isn't it? Well, it is, Ray. And 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 you know, in microcosm, we chose this because it is such a great case study for so many of the red flags that we talk about in relation to company formations. Shall we work through a few of them, Graham? Yeah, let's let's do that. OK, so I think we have to start with a number of data corrections in the record, don't we? Yeah, Ray, honestly, I'm not sure I've ever seen anyone make quite so many amendments. We've got, as you've already seen, Juan to Pablo and Hasborn overseas to Hasbro overseas. We didn't bore you with one of the directors of, of Laydon was originally a lady called Sokolova, who then became Solova. Hector couldn't decide if he was born in 1975 or 1973. Mm. So it's kind of all over the place, and that's ignoring the resignations. Um, and then, Ray, we should talk about the names of the companies themselves. Yeah, yeah, this is a good point. Um, because if you're setting up a business, you generally want the business name to convey some meaning. Um, that may be because it's named after the founder or a member of the founder's family, like Marks and Spencer, um, or, or named for what it does, like uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, or Poundland. Yes, and, and frankly, Laydon and Lirum are names that just don't appear to relate to, to either anyone or anything that this enterprise is involved in. Mm. No, and we see so many firms like Luxburg Networks and Bergport Systems and the like that it, it almost becomes possible to tell the nature of the company simply by its name. Yeah, I think it, they are highly indicative of shell companies, names like that, aren't they? Mm, yes, and I think there are two reasons for that. Um, one is that they're usually formed in bulk uh, and therefore employing an algorithm to create a company name makes more sense than trying to think all of them up individually and then checking to see if they're taken. Uh, and that makes complete sense. Um, the second one then, Ray? Well, these people don't want to tie themselves to the company name because uh, it's an unnecessary risk and they might at some point want to distance themselves from the company. So having their name built into the company name makes that quite difficult. Well, yes, it does. So, so it's a reasonable assertion to say that if you find a company and I'm going to make one up called Doreen Davis Direct Deliveries Limited. Nice. And it yeah, thank you. Um, and it's so, I thought, alliterative as well. Mm, kind of, yeah, very yeah. good. Thank you. Um, and its sole director <laughs> and PSC is called Doreen Davis. Well, then you can pretty much guarantee it's completely above board or it's the best double bluff you've ever come across. Yes. And then, of course, we have this thing about diverse geographical uh, or, uh, ownership and control. Uh, yeah. Now, I know you follow the fortunes of an Indian lady director called Hema Naronha, who is a great source of such companies. Um, hundreds, in fact. And by way of example, I give you just one of the, the lesser ones, and it's called Delta Crown Sales Limited. One of mm -hmm. those names again, right? Um, oh, yeah. Six directors, five resignations. Let's have a browse through those directors in the company's house record, shall we? Yeah, let's. So we start with uh, Hema who you've noted is from um, India. Yep. Uh, then we also have Starwell International Limited. From the lovely Caribbean island of Nevis. Indeed. Um, we have the wonderfully named Lathian <laughs> living in an island called Danny Banger. And that really is his name. Well, that's a kind of anglicisation of his name, but yeah. <laughs> Be careful how you bandy a word uh, around the word uh, really there. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we also have uh, Yushun Lee. Yeah, Korean. But, uh, uh, we're, we're spreading our wings here well, aren't we, Ray? Aren't we? Um, uh, we also have Finel Limited. Yeah, Cyprus. Yeah. Um, Cyprus, I, I, Cyprus. Is that a bit like New York? New York so good they so, it twice. It's, it's yeah, like, yeah. I, I think the same. Much the same can be said of Cyprus, Graham. <laughs> Excellent. Um, um, and then we have uh, Trendmax Inc., uh, uh, which isn't probably, in America as the name would suggest, but no, uh, no uh, Dominica. Dominica. So uh, some lovely locations. Many of them would have become known as sunny places for shady people. But that's, well, I bet their annual general meetings are interesting. Uh, and I wonder what language they're conducted in. Well, yes. And, and, and once you can all fly again, the airfares for 
getting together would be pretty expensive, <laughs> wouldn't they? Well, certainly for a doorman company. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as I said just now, this is just one of Hemmer's, I mean, literally hundreds of UK directorships, and, and some are even more diverse than that. Yeah, she could sustain several episodes of our podcast all by herself. And maybe one day, Ray, she will. Maybe she will. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, Ray, we've got a final red flag. Uh, yeah, we've already alluded to it, Graham. It's web presence. Um, real businesses rarely seek anonymity. They want to be known, recommended and easy to find. Yeah, that's that's true, isn't it? I, I I honestly can't think of a legitimate business that doesn't want anyone to know about them. I mean, frankly, most of them pay money to get themselves and their name out there. Uh, they do, Graham. Um, I'd say that a real business cannot afford not to have a website. And yet very few of these shell businesses have any web presence at all. And we're not just talking about a website. These entities often aren't mentioned anywhere on, on the web or at least nowhere on the web that you can easily find. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we, we haven't gone and looked for them on the dark web. Who knows what we'd find there? Mm. Um, I think, Graham, if I was onboarding a business as a bank uh, and the account opening form left the website box blank, I'd be asking questions. Well, Ray, I, th I think you'd be right, but I also think you might well be in a minority as far as most banks are concerned. And, and frankly, checking the register for multiple data changes or recognising international ownership or control shouldn't be difficult either. But I'm not sure it's routinely used as a control mm. in, in most organisations. Uh, these shell company red flags appear again and again in the laundromats and other shady activity. And if it weren't such a dreadful cliche, Graham, I'd introduce the concept of rocket science at this point. And, and as you know, I would be quite happy to spend a few minutes chatting about rocket science with you, Ray, <laughs> but it's probably not the right moment. Um, no. But, but, but Ray, I mean, this is where we come to the crux of, of this presentation of why we do it. It is so easy for bad actors to abuse specifically the UK companies, Ray, regime to create shell companies to further their dark money activities. But why should that be, Graham? Well, because it's been actively encouraged by the UK government, Ray. Uh, what has shady dealings with bad actors? Well, well, well no, not, not that. But the government really does want people to be able to start businesses in the UK easily and, and quickly. It, it is supposed to generate UK earnings and economic growth. Uh, but a company established here needs no physical presence here and need not be owned here. Uh, in all the laundromats, it's overseas criminals owning and controlling these UK companies. Yes, it is. And what, what they like is that it's really easy to set up a company here in the UK. And, and a UK entity has this impression of probity. They get recognisable formats like Limited and LLP and, and nobody apparently looks twice at, it, at a UK company with those suffixes. And the fact that they're searchable in an internationally accessible open register gives the impression that they're above board. Yeah, so, so everyone listening who works in FIs, how many of your organisations actively look at onboarding or frankly at review for all of those red flags? Mm, it's interesting to think about that because these four red flags are highly indicative of firms set up to engage in known and proven money laundering schemes. Yeah, and if it were me, I'm not sure that I or, or we as a, as a company would want to let them through our door with so much as a second glance. Uh, but Graham, assuming that they have come through the door, uh, and I think we can assume that at least some of them have. Mm. Um, I reckon we can identify them quite easily from their transactional activity. Oh, I agree, Ray, but that is a story for another day. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we'll be picking up this thread in a subsequent live event, provided there's demand, where we look inside the ongoing operation of a real laundromat and examine actual bank account statements to see how it was done. And in the process, we will leave you like we've done today with some transactional red flags to look out for, which we which we think most firms aren't always looking for. Uh, so keep an eye on the social media uh, on the social media and um, register for that if you want to when it comes up. Yes, and uh, we may do one more of these um, to accommodate everyone who wants to attend. But but either before or after that, at some point soon anyway, we will be scheduling that next topic. 
We will, Graham. Um, and at this point, I think let's go across to George, who I hope has some questions for us to discuss. 